gives me very great pleasure to introduce Wayne Gore. Wayne, apart from his indiscretion of supporting Otago rugby team, um, has had a very interesting career. He's been a major mover in the movement Rethinking Crime and Punishment, which if you think about the real IRA, IRA is probably right like the uh, real um, sensible sensitive sensing trust, I think. They're the people who actually look at the evidence of what works. And I have a strong feeling about this myself. It always seemed to me that where somebody is nasty and violent because they had a nasty and violent upbringing, and then they are put with a whole lot of other nasty and violent, violent men in a very nasty and violent environment. And somehow we have a strange, some people have a strange idea that somehow this is going to make them nice people, which has never seemed to me enormously sensible, really. So I'm delighted that we have Wayne with us. Wayne is doing a PhD looking at sensor, the um, sensor, sensiting sensors. Sentencing <laughs> in New Zealand. Straight the um, teeth up. <laughs> um, for a PhD, which is, means that uh, he is able to have a time of reflection, a time of really collecting the real evidence about what works and what doesn't work, and uh, just how well our justice system is doing. It seems at the moment to be rather heading in the direction of the United States. It would be nice if we did a bit of a, a U-turn, considering how badly their system seems to be operating. So it gives me great delight to welcome Wayne to our club this evening, and be delighted to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Graham. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, in fact, what I've come to talk to you about is the way we receive information on crime and the way that crime is treated in the media and politically. And I'm going to show you that there's more to the story than you usually hear. It's my view that the media treats crime and the way the political process responds to crime is a problem. This reduces our ability to make good decisions. For most people, the media is probably the principal source of information on crime. Sensational and horrific offences attract coverage. They attract repeated coverage. There's coverage when the offence occurs, there's coverage when an arrest is made, there's coverage if there's a trial, and there's more coverage when the sentence is imposed. As a result, the public mood and view of crime tends to be distorted. According to Warren Young, research consistently shows that the public overestimate their own personal risk from crime, overestimate the proportion of crime that involves violence, overestimate the risk of reoffending, and underestimate the severity of sentences. Equally though, research shows that if you take a group of people and show them some sentences and ask them their opinion first about the sentences, they often say that the sentences are too light. You then reveal to them the facts of the case, give them some concept of the basis on which the judge imposed the sentence, and the views reverse. They either accept that the sentence is reasonable, or they take the view that the sentence is in fact too harsh. A more mundane, higher volume offending attracts very little media coverage. But from time to time, the release of statistics does get coverage. Most often it's the police's regular re release of recorded crime statistics that gets picked up. And occasionally there are stories about the use of sentences and the numbers of people in prison. The most recent release of recorded crime was in April. You may remember hearing that recorded crime has fallen for the second year in a row. And that the numbers are now at a 15 year low. The police and the government attributed the decrease to more police officers and changes in policing strategy. Focus was placed on the simple numbers. Because the number had fallen, it could be celebrated. There was little reference to the crime rate. But to properly understand crime, it's critical to concentrate on the rate rather than the simple number. For instance, if we were discussing two countries, 
and all we knew was that they had the same volume and mix of crime, but we knew nothing else, then we would think that they were equally safe or equally unsafe. But if we added to that knowledge the notion that one country had twice the population of the other, then we would immediately think that it was much more safe than, than the first country, the second country, whichever way around it was. Taking account of population is important in making comparisons, and it applies to comparisons across time just as much as comparisons between countries. Controlling po for population enables us to make a proper judgment about whether things are getting safer or not. What's happening in New Zealand? The current recorded crime time series begins in 1994. The crime rate has actually been falling pretty consistently across the last 18 years. It's now 25% lower than it was in 1994. That graph suggests to me that a lot of the recent changes can be seen as a part of a much longer term change that's been going on since at least 1994. Quite a lot of it is just simple demographic change, ageing of the population and the like. But it's attracted very little attention. Yet you might expect that the government and the police would want to shout that from the rooftops. Why don't they? They can't, largely because it's not consistent with the statements they've made over time. They've got a vested interest in the crime problem. They've been bombarding us with the crime problem for years. Now it's a little difficult to draw attention to information that suggests that crime has actually been going down over quite a long period. And if the government draws attention to it, it is automatically pointing out that crime was falling during the tenure of the Labour government. The politicians and police hierarchy don't want to focus on this trend because it challenges their portrayal of crime as bad before and only getting better now due to their decisions and actions. They have a very short time horizon. I thought in passing you might just be interested in what occurred prior to 94. This graph is based on information from Statistics New Zealand that's drawn from a variety of sources. So it's, it's not rock solid information, but interestingly the crime rate started to decrease in about 1992, and prior to that, it was rising since the mid-1950s. Hmm. Um, I think the other interesting thing about that graph is that while the government have championed to some extent the idea that the sheer number of crimes is at a 15-year low, that graph actually shows that the crime rate itself is at a 32-year low, a more impressive statistic, I think. But reported crime is just one part of a picture. The fuller picture can be gained by looking at sentencing and at what goes on in the prisons. The next graph shows the incarceration rate for a group of offences, violent, drug and dishonesty offences, and sentencing over a 30-year time period. It's incarceration because it includes both prison and home detention sentences and it's necessary to combine them together because they work in an interchangeable fashion and to exclude home detention would mess around the imprisonment rate. As you can see, the incarceration rate has been rising over the last 30 years. It rose slowly through the 1980s, but much more quickly in the last 20 years. We now incarcerate 150. Uh, the rate is now 155 percent higher than it was in 1980. In turn, that's contributed to a real increase in the prison population. By 2010, the number of prisoners in New Zealand per 100,000 of the population was 115 percent higher than in 1980. The increased incarceration rate longer sentences and later release on parole have far outweighed the reduction in recorded offences. Is there a connection or a logic that binds together the crime rate, the incarceration rate and the imprisonment rate? Greater use of incarceration, the larger prison population could be the cause of the decrease in the crime rate. It could be evidence that some people are deterred from offending by more severe sentencing or that some people are prevented from offending because they are incapacitated. International research suggests that there is a small effect from incapacitation and virtually none from deterrence. That research appears to be at odds with what is happening in New Zealand. 
to test this, we need to focus on violent offending. Almost all of the policy changes that have occurred in the last 30 years have been aimed at violent offending, at being harder on violent offenders and reducing violent offending. The incarceration rate for violent offenders has gone up by 184%. It has gone up substantially more than the general rate of increase. So the policies have been applied, judges have been sentencing more severely, violent offenders are sentenced more severely. But if deterrence and incapacitation are having the desired effects, then we should see a steeper decrease in the violent crime rate than we do for offending in general. But actually, there hasn't been a decrease in violent offending at all. The rate was pretty flat for 10 years or so, and it's actually increased in the last few years. And it's not because there's been a jump in less serious offences. The bottom line on that graph shows the rate of offending for, for a set of offences that the police label as serious violence. It shows a pretty similar level of increase to general violence. So the, the targeting has occurred. More severe sentences have been imposed. But offending has actually risen. <coughs> 